Hello, Working Preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. Our fall campaign is in full swing, but we still need your help to reach our goal before November 30th. We're celebrating Working Preacher as a community of imagination this week. I'm grateful for writers, actors, musicians, and well, those people who allow me to pretend that I am one of those persons. I've appreciated the patterns of being able to be creative, whether trying to repeat what I've seen in art or trying to describe with words the awesomeness of what it means to experience God and put it in words. Those people in my life are the kinds of people that make me the preacher I am. You can make your gift to the fall campaign in honor or memory of someone who supports you in your faith journey. I can't wait to see who you honor with your generosity to Working Preacher. And thank you to every one of you who have given so generously already. You can go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecke. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for November 19th, uh, 2023. It's the last uh, Sunday after Pentecost. Next Sunday is Christ the King. Uh, and our text for this Sunday is Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, and chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. So, uh, there's not actually a lot of time in between Hosea and Isaiah. In fact, last week we were in Hosea, um, uh, and they they almost certainly overlap, these two prophets, Hosea and Isaiah, both in the 8th century BCE. Uh, but we, we have moved in geography. So last week, Hosea is, is prophesying to the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, this week, Isaiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, and Isaiah begins with um, uh, with a, a, a metaphor. We talked last week about uh, the metaphor of the relationship between God and Israel as being like a, a parent and child. Uh, that's what we talked about last week, or a, a marriage metaphor. Here, uh, the the metaphor has shifted to in in uh, chapter five to Israel as an unfruitful vineyard. Vineyard. Uh, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. Uh, and goes on to talk about the vineyard that does not bear fruit. Uh, and the prophet seems to be speaking uh, on behalf of God here. The uh, the beloved, uh, the owner of the vineyard uh, is God, and Israel is uh, the vineyard. So it says that right, uh, right there in verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting he expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. Uh, it doesn't really work as well in English, but those are word plays in uh, in Hebrew. Uh, justice and bloodshed sound alike. Righteousness and cry sound alike. So uh, here, uh, and then, of course, in chapter 11, uh, we see the promises of God for uh, a faithful king who will reign in righteousness, a son of David. So, uh, you have both judgment and mercy here this Sunday, so we you can continue really uh, with what we were talking about last week with uh, the prophets expressing God's heart. Uh, it seems like the prophets of all the writers of Scripture seem to know God's heart, know God's uh, suffering, God's anger, God's mercy, God's love, uh, all of those together, and we see that in these passages for this week. The um, the theme of um... The theme of the the chapter five uh, is is a familiar theme throughout Old and New Testament, where um, God's people are compared to a vine. There's Psalms uh, that tease this out, and Jesus, of course, uh, has parables that relate to this. The language, though, is the traditional language of a love song. So, if you were to go to the Song of Songs. Um, you get language like this. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate, uh, like an apple tree, among other tra- apple trees is my beloved man, uh, and so on. And so when this starts out, let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. This is very traditional language. And notice that the prophet has not yet even said this is prophecy. 
Um, think of this literally as a love song. Um, I, I, I like to think of it as, oh, oh, my uncle's a priest because Isaiah was a priest. Let's have him do our wedding. Uh, and so he comes and he starts the wedding song that he's going to sing. I wrote a song for you for your wedding. And it sounds right at first, right? My beloved had a vineyard on a very, oh, this is, this is a love song. He dug it. He cleared it. He planted it. He built a watchtower. This is, this is going really well. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes or sour grapes. Wait a uh, minute. Yeah. And then and, uh, notice now suddenly the singer is me. Mm -hmm. Judge between me and my vineyard. First of all, it was my beloved at a vineyard. Now you got the subtle shift. Now I'm judge between me. Was I not right to expect grapes? And then, so here's what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, tear down its walls, and so far, you're still not sure what it is. And then it says, I will command the clouds to rain no rain upon it. Oh, oh, now we're dealing with God. And so it's just, it's a beautiful parable where he pulls you in uh slowly and uh that's what will happen if you ask prophets to <laughs> preach at your wedding <laughs> and it's about justice though we should we should take a word about that um he expected justice but saw bloodshed righteousness but heard an outcry what does it mean for god's people to live justice and righteousness answer in less than one minute professor moore Oh, what does it mean? Uh, over and over again, the question is about uh, idolatry and oppression. So injustice looks like uh, oppression. And that oppression often uh, is a result of us having chosen the wrong um, powers uh, to uh, follow, to submit to, or the wrong gods um, uh, to worship. And those gods might be um, things, they might be identities, they might be nations. Um, but when we uh, turn ourselves to a power other than uh, the Creator God made known in Jesus, we're likely to uh, enact a system that is oppressive. I think that's less than a minute. Excellent. If I could add, uh, I, I think actually the next verse really uh, helps to uh, explain injustice. Uh, verse 8, I'll you, I, you, who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is room for no one but you, and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land. So just a quick story about that. My, my grandfather, uh, his picture actually is right here behind me, uh, good Missouri Synod Lutheran, uh, studied the Bible every day. He was a milkman, right? He delivered milk, but he did have some uh, some seminary studies. Had to quit seminary to take care of his his uh, mother and sisters after his father died. He would not shop at Walmart in our hometown, and I come from the land of Walmart, right? I've come from southern Missouri. There were probably four Walmarts within a twenty mile radius. Grandpa would not shop at Walmart. Not because he knew the you know small town merchants, which he did, and he was friends with them, but because of this verse, he said, "Ah, you who join house to house, who add field to field, until there is room for no one but you, and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land." Right? I mean, that's that's, that's like great. living, uh, you know, knowing the word so deeply that you that you live it in your life. Right? That that uh, uh, the people who are so greedy, who, can, who don't know the meaning of enough, right? Who just add more and more and more until they're alone, right? I mean, the, the punishment is that they are alone in the midst of the land uh, and just surrounded by their possessions. I mean, I think that says a lot about what injustice is uh, and what oppression is. I always take yeah. that dif differently. I, uh, that is that they force other people and so they're the ones who are alone. But it's interesting to, to, to flip that around. I would also add where I've seen this is um, in, the, in the suburb where my mom and dad live, now my dad lives there now, um, the city used eminent domain to shut down successful businesses because they weren't the kind of businesses they liked. There was an mm -hmm. ethnic restaurant. There was a, a man who ran an excellent uh, automobile repair shop. And uh, the government said, you know, you're doing fine. And these businesses are all profitable and they serve the community, but they wanted uh, 
more upscale. So they so they used eminent domain and they stole their land. They didn't pay them a fair price. And they didn't pay them a price that with uh, all the permits you need to set up, these people couldn't set up anywhere else. So they were they were just gone and for no reason. Joy, you were about to say something. Sorry. But actually, I was I was going to lean in the same way you did in terms of uh, catching that striking idea that Catherine had said in terms of until they are alone. And um, uh, it's, it's kind of you get what you ask for and maybe what you ask for. Right. Uh, isn't what you really wanted. So uh, I, I also was struck by that. Um, but I, I, I think that uh, the, the two uh, powerful ways that you two have described it also invites us to take a look at that uh, additional reading that is uh, from the 11th chapter of, of Isaiah. Um, which uh, we often know of as 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 the the peaceful 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 kingdom, um, but uh, as we talk about uh, businesses, uh, particularly those big box businesses that take over, I think uh, one of the things that's very real in our world right now is how news is broadcast, and um, it for me it gives new meaning to the idea of what is gossip. And uh, so I find this text very interesting because uh, uh, it says, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. How often is it that what we see as big box stores or hear on social media that gives us a critique, um, we allow to enable us uh, to uh, practice uh, injustice, to oppress, uh, to um, not uh, be concerned for the meek, uh, to uh, do the very thing that um, is the practice of idolatry that we spoke of in the previous verses. And, and so um, I think pairing these two together um, invites us to do, you know, what I like to say, and, and I said last week, and that is the invitation for us to embody um, the righteousness of God. And so uh, Isaiah, who's a strong prophet to call out um, um, idolatry and uh, the oppression that angers God, also um, in this book we find a clear evidence of hope. And this mm -hmm. text is one of them that in the midst of the horror that is our reality, war, um, division in families, um, economic uh, uh, disability, that there is hope. And that hope is, well, that hope is a strange countercultural counter community that embodies the acts of God. We should, it's worth, thank you. Okay. Uh, you were gonna say, I'm guessing you're gonna go where I will, Catherine, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Ralph, go ahead. We should point out that this is a messianic text. Right. Verse one, a shoot shall come forth from the stump of Jesse. Um, the, 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 the messianic promise was made to David, who was Jesse's son. So son. the stump of Jesse is talking about the family tree of David that has been cut off. But the promise was uh, the Messiah will come. Um, and it's interesting, uh, the word that's translated here as, as um, if I can get this right, a branch is um, Netzer, kind of rhymes with Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. And, uh, and of course, uh, leaning into Advent is just around the corner uh, that we believe this promise is fulfilled in Jesus, who has inaugurated the peaceable kingdom that is both here and not here fully.